Hey subscribers, welcome back to another video of Science with Serbeck. Today what we're going to be talking about is section 13.4. And in section 13.4 it's going to deal with the conservation of energy. So before we get started here, just a couple of, of objectives I want you to be able to accomplish by the end of this section. So number one, determine the different types of energy transformations. Objective number two, define the law of conservation of energy and use it in applicable phases. And then number three, determine what the efficiency of machines is through a calculation. So before we really jump into the, the conservation of energy, we need to understand that there are some different types of energy. Now these are some different types of energy, some, some of the main ones that we'll look at, and we'll start here with mechanical energy. So mechanical energy is defined as the amount of work an object can do because of the object's kinetic and potential energies. Now that's energies plural, so let me pause and write that down. All right, so there is that written definition. Now this can simply be put into a chemical, or not a chemical formula, but a formula where our Me is mechanical energy is equal to the potential energy plus the kinetic energy. So it's saying everything that we've looked at, potential and kinetic up to this point, can be thought of, the, the total overall is, can be thought of as mechanical energy. And now a good example of this, a good example of this is swinging swinging a baseball bat. I'm just going to put swinging a bat. As somebody swings the bat and they start to move the bat, the bat actually begins to move, which is that kinetic energy. Now, because of the way people swing a bat, uh, there is also still potential energy as they, they swing and follow through. So the mechanical energy is combining both kinetic and potential together. We move down here to chemical energy. And chemical energy is the energy formed in a chemical reaction when bonds between atoms break apart, rearrange, and form new substances. So again, let me pause and write that down. All right, so there is that definition there. Now, chemical energy is just another form, another specific form of potential energy. And it's all because of those chemical bonds, whether it's a covalent or ionic bond, uh, it's all because of those chemical bonds that are involved in those particular chemicals. Now the last type of energy that we need to talk about before we move on here is electrical energy. And electrical energy is just, just defined as the transfer of energy of a charged particle in, a, in an electrical field. So there's that definition written down. And a great example of this, of electrical energy, is going to be lightning, lightning in a thunderstorm. And I'm going to abbreviate that in a T-storm. All right, so you have uh, lightning as it is transferring that energy. Uh, it's because you have that shift in particles or that transfer of energy in those particular particles. So uh, moving on here, uh, moving on here to the next page, moving on here to the next page, uh, we have the conservation of energy and the law of conservation of energy. So I'm going to adjust pages here. And we're going to talk about a couple of things. So number one, the conservation of energy has a couple of things, a couple of points to, to make uh, note of. One, energy readily changes from one form to another. So those three forms, and there's some other forms too that we didn't talk about, changes from one form to another. So let me write that point down. The other main point about this conservation of energy is the total amount of energy is going to stay the same over all 
uh, periods or all systems, anything that happens, that total energy stays the chains. The big thing here is it's just going to change form. So we have that second point uh, to note about the conservation of energy. Again, the energy that we have here is always going to be shifting different forms, but the overall amount of energy is going to stay the same. And this really leads right into the law of conservation, which states that energy cannot be created or destroyed. All right. So with the law of conservation, a main point, main takeaway here is the total energy in the universe stays, stays the same. So to highlight a couple of these things, uh, we are going to go over some different types of examples. So the first example, the first example that I have here is going to be is going to be of a roller coaster. And so with our roller coaster, and I'll draw a probably a poor picture here, but we have our roller coaster track and we have this little rectangle is our cart. And so as the cart goes down this hill and goes back up to this peak, what happens is that moving energy, that kinetic energy, is transferred to potential energy. And so at the top of this peak, and I'm gonna make a mark here with my red pen, uh, at the top of this peak right here, most energy, not all, but most energy is potential energy, or PE. Now, as the cart or as the roller coaster goes back downhill, what happens here is this. The potential energy as the cart travels downhill is now transferred back to kinetic energy. However, there is also some energy lost as heat. Now, most of you probably haven't touched the tracks of a roller coaster as it's gone by, and I would not suggest doing that, but there is some heat lost. And so when we account for the total overall energy of this roller coaster as it goes through a process, yes, we have to account for the changes in kinetic and potential energy and vice versa, but we also have to account for energy that is lost in things like heat. And so our second example that we have, the second example is just going to be bouncing a ball. Think of a, a tennis ball. So our second example here is just going to be bouncing a ball. So when a ball is dropped, uh, we've all done this with a basketball, volleyball, whatever type of ball. When a ball is dropped from a certain height, it transfers a lot of potential energy to kinetic energy. So, ball gets dropped, and I'm going to use some abbreviations here, and potential energy remember as you hold the ball up at a certain height and you let it drop and I can simulate that with the pin it's gonna have potential energy but that uh, potential energy is going to be transferred to kinetic energy however we've all seen this where we drop a ball that ball does not keep bouncing up and down forever. Eventually it comes to a stop. It, it does not bounce anymore. So we have to account for where that energy is transferred. So I'm gonna make another note here. Not all is transferred to that kinetic energy. So a lot of the potential energy is transferred to kinetic energy, but not all of it. So where does that heat go? That should be that next question. And so the energy from a bouncing ball, the energy of a ball 
is also transferred also transferred in non mechanical or to non mechanical forms uh, an example of this would be heat so heat remember most of the time we think of heat as getting really really hot well, that's not always the case here. As that ball makes impact with the ground, what happens here is some of that energy that was potential, and as it transferred down, it went to kinetic, and then as it hit that, that particular surface, it's going to transfer it as some heat to that particular surface. Same thing can be done if you rub your hands together. Again, uh, we are transferring uh, that potential energy to kinetic and if you just move your hands once yeah, you feel a little bit of friction and a little bit of heat but if you have a lot of movement a lot of friction that uh, gets or produces a lot more heat and that's transferring that energy into that version of heat and it's a non-mechanical form because heat is not potential or kinetic energy all right so uh, another example here as we transfer the uh, page is this uh, we have a firework a firework as it goes into the air it will um, have obviously potential energy from the chemicals or chemical energy it's transferred to potential and kinetic and then eventually and then eventually it is transferred um, to heat and light which is that non-mechanical uh, forms and then also sound all right, so uh, before we get to efficiencies, there are three different systems that we need to define when we're talking about energy. So the first is an open system. And in an open system, energy and matter are exchanged with the surroundings. So there's the definition there. The best example for an open system is simply a coffee cup. Uh, particularly a styrofoam coffee cup. So in a coffee cup, we'll say that this is our coffee cup, we have uh, a particular liquid here. We'll make it a, a red look liquid. And in this, the thing that I just drew in red, this is the actual system. And then everything else, everything else that I drew around it is going to be the surroundings. So anything that's not the uh, that's not what's drawn in red and I'll make a point here anything that's not drawn in red to include the actual coffee cup is going to be is going to be the surroundings again heat if we've ever dealt with a uh, um, coffee cup heat is transferred out eventually that hot chocolate or coffee whatever you drink out of it will have the heat dissipate out of that and that's because it's an open system now a closed system is a system in which energy but not matter is exchanged so let me write that down I had to change pen colors there on you but an example of a closed system is a greenhouse now, a greenhouse, the way a greenhouse works, we have this building, and we'll call this our greenhouse, and we'll put a roof on it. And the way a greenhouse works is this. Energy from the sun, and I'll draw this here in green, uh, energy from the sun, which is in that electromagnetic radiation, comes in comes in and I'll draw this here comes into the greenhouse and as it comes in it transfers energy as heat and this energy in our greenhouse is going to stay in the greenhouse now again the energy is transferred but there's no uh, matter that is exchanged here so uh, we get here in our greenhouse energy energy from the sun stays 
in the greenhouse. Now we move down here to our isolated system here. And this is a little bit more difficult to have an example for, but an isolated system is a system in which there is neither energy nor matter exchange. So like I said, our example for an isolated system, a little bit more abstract, a little bit more relatable to uh, just science or applicable just to science, but we have these things called a bomb calorimeter. Now, in the sense of a bomb calorimeter, essentially uh, there's no huge explosion like you would think of a, with a bomb, but what we have here, and this is gonna be a really crude picture, is this. We have a container. Uh, most of the time it's, it's some type of metal, some type of strong metal, and you put a lid on this particular container. Now inside this container, what I'm gonna draw here is a test tube or a flask, and this test tube or flask is also, is also going to be covered. So in this box, what I'm trying to represent with this box is this. Uh, no energy, no energy can get in or out. And inside here, inside here, we can just look at the energy of a system. So let's say a chemical reaction is happening here. So with this, with this isolated system is the energy, the energy of a system can be measured. Okay, so now we have three different systems. Again, that's just a, another way to specify, all right, we're talking about energy, and then we're also talking about, well, where can that energy exist? How can that uh, be possible? Or what are our different types of things related to energy? So uh, keep that in mind as we move on to efficiency, which is our last part of section four. So efficiency, you've probably heard this term before, and it has a very similar, um, very similar type of meaning in physics here. So in our efficiency, it's just how well something does work. And so with efficiency, the true definition here is this. This is the ratio of useful work output to total work input. So let me write that down. Now that's a nice definition, but uh, for me, I need a formula. That would be really helpful here. And so our formula for efficiency is this, E for efficiency, which does not have a unit, is equal, is equal to the useful, useful work. And this useful work, uh, remember, work is going to be expressed in joules, is going to be divided by the work input. And again, this needs to be in joules. And then we multiply it by a hundred. That's because this will give you a decimal uh, and we want it as a percent. So uh, with efficiency, we have to keep this in mind. Only a portion of the work of any machine is useful work. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, really any type of example of a machine, from a simple machine to something like a car, some of that, that work that is done from something like a combustion engine inside a car is only uh, producing so much useful work to make that car go forward. So something to keep in mind here as we go through this, uh, we have no 100% um, no efficient machine. So there will be there will be some work that is lost due to some other aspect, most of the time heat or friction that is lost. 
So let's go ahead and let's calculate our efficiency. So we have a sailor that's on a sailboat and this sailor raises a sail that weighs 140 newtons, a height of, that's one meter. If this sailor does 180 joules of work to pull this sail up, we wanna know what is the efficiency of the pulley. So the efficiency, remember the efficiency formula from just above is efficiency is equal to the useful useful work in joules divided by the work input again in joules and we multiply it by 100 so we go through here in this problem the question is hey what is the efficiency so that's going to be our big question mark our useful work needs to be in joules so we look over here and we say, hey, we have joules, but that's how much work the sailor put in. We also have newtons and meters. If you can remember, work is force times distance, we can find our joule. So we take 140 newtons times one meter, which this should be an easy calculation. This gives us 140 joules. Now, our work input, our work input that occurs here is this. That sailor, he had to or she had to pull on that particular pulley, that rope, 180 joules. So that's how much work they inputted. So uh, running out of space here, but we get to efficiency, which I'm going to abbreviate as E, is going to be equal to our 140 joules of useful work divided by 180 joules of the work we actually put in, and then we multiply this by 100. Now, all I need to do here is plug this into my particular calculator, and so what I'm going to do is take 140 divided by 180, I press enter, and then remember, I gotta multiply by 100 because I want efficiency expressed as a percent. So this particular pulley on this sailboat is 78, I'm gonna do some rounding, 78% efficient. All right, so uh, a little bit of a longer section here with section four. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this video. And as always, make sure you subscribe.